Okay, I'd like to welcome you to today's physics colloquium. Our speaker today is Dr. Anthea Koster, Associate Director of the Haystack Observatory at MIT, a distinguished climate scientist. Today, her talk will be on the history of science. Lisa Meitner, her dramatic escape from Germany and discovery of nuclear fission. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and I, I should say I'm only the assistant director at Haystack, uh, which you, will, you may have heard of it because of all the work we're doing now with imaging the black hole, but I actually do atmospheric science. So I actually was given this material. I'm not a nuclear physicist, but I was just handed it because of my family connection, and that's my grandfather is the one who got her out of Lisa Meitner, and you're gonna be hearing about this. But it's kind of nice today, in case anybody isn't aware, it's International Women's Day, and um, I put this talk together back actually in 2010 because I was visiting my aunts, and I realized I had was being given all this material, and there's a lot of important themes that run through this talk that I think actually affect everybody in this room as both an individual, as a scientist, and as a member, you know, as a, a, a citizen. Uh, there's just different themes, one of which, and only one of which, is about women in science. So you, I'm gonna touch on all of these themes, and I hope that, if nothing else, I hope you know who and what Lisa Meitner did at the end of this talk. And I also wanna say I mispronounce everything I grew up in Texas, and uh, my father was Dutch, but I actually uh, can't really speak Dutch. I can understand some of it, and just I apologize in advance about that. So the way we're gonna, we're gonna talk about her role in the discovery of fission and her dramatic escape from Germany, uh, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of introduction first, sort of put everything in context, and so you'll know where I'm coming from and how I got this, I'm gonna talk about her early years because I think that's one of the things we all forget is how hard it was for women to actually even go to university at the turn of the last century. Um, we'll talk about her escape from Germany, the discovery of fission, later years, and then I have some interesting comments. And I'm gonna warn you, I think this is a 60 minute talk, sorry. So Lisa Meitner actually discovered the element protactinium with Otto Hahn in 1918. Now, just want you to know, he was actually actively involved in World War I at work, so she did a lot of the actual discovery part here. Um, but it was based on that that I think she became one of the first, if not the first, professor in Germany, female professors in Germany. She actually discovered the Auger effect in 1922, but it's buried, I, I give credit, it's not in this, her paper was not focused on that, that's radiationless collisions. Um, but uh, then the year later, Auger, who was a graduate student in France, actually focused on that, and it's named after him, and you'll hear about this again later. Um, she was the first interpreter of fission observations, and in a sense, names nuclear fission. She was nominated for the Nobel Prize 12 times, many times by Niels Bohr, and uh, the element 109, and I'm gonna mispronounce this, might Miriam was named after her, and that was just recently, I think, in the 1990s. Uh, and I found this quote, and it really touches me. Um, this is somebody who is a African-American playwright uh, in New York, but he wrote, when female stories are muted, we are teaching our kids that their dignity is second, uh, sorry, second class and the historical accounts of their lives are less relevant. And I just want you to keep this in mind because I think, although I was hearing it's not so much true in Germany, but I think in the US, until Ruth Lewin Sign took up her cause, her name was largely forgotten over here in the US. So I've dedicated this talk to people who actually deserve the credit. <laughs> uh, one is Professor Ruth Lewin Sign. She's actually the author of the book, 
Lise Meitner, A Life in Physics. I highly recommend this book. She spent 30 years compiling it and getting it written. She started this research uh, in the 1960s when she was teaching chemistry at Sacramento uh, City State College, and there was no mention of her. In, I mean, there's a lot of mention of Otto Hahn and a lot of the other people. Uh, this is a time when women's, uh, oops, sorry, when women's, where'd that word to go? When women's um, uh, issues were coming to front, and they said there's, there's no mention. So she, uh, she then started doing research. She started writing my father about the escape in 1970, which was when I was the first, had started the first year college student at University of Texas, and, my, and that's when the stories started coming out. And I realized up until that time, my father really had not talked at all about what happened during the war. And it was like this sort of touched a nerve, and all of a sudden, a lot of information started coming out, and I learned a lot. I also dedicate this to Rosemary Reed. You're going to see uh, parts of this film and this talk. She's the director of the film, The Path to Nuclear Fission, the story of Lisa Meitner and Otto Hahn. She's given me permission to show this. She also has a recent film that I haven't seen, I'm dying to, about Irene uh, Joliet-Curie, and I think we should all try to get a copy of it. And then here's my family members, uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, Sorry, I said it's a little emotional, but that's my father, <laughs> sorry, my aunts and my uncle and my grandfather. And my, uh, I started doing this when I realized that they were not going to live forever. And especially 10, 15 years ago, I realized that they were in their 90s. My father had already passed away, and if I didn't start collecting this material and putting it, and I'm the only one of all the cousins that went into physics, so I said, I know people who would be interested in these stories. And that, that's sort of how I started putting this together. So here is a picture of Max von Lau. This is in Germany. It's at the, well, the, the precursor to the Max Planck Institute, but it's Max von Lau, who is a Nobel Prize winner, and I forget what he won the Nobel Prize for, Lisa Meitner, and that's my grandfather. And the first time I saw this photograph, I was pretty amazed, because I. He, my grandfather ended up with MS and died actually before I was born. Most of the later photographs, he's not, he's in a wheelchair or sitting down. So this is one of the few pictures I have where you can see him standing up and tall before he really got sick. Um, but he actually was a friend of Lisa Meitner's and she came to visit him in Groningen and she went to see him. Uh, he, she came to see him and he gave her a tour of Holland and he went a few times to Germany to visit them. Um, so one of the, as I said, I've had now a, a pretty long career. I actually got to give this talk at the Niels Bohr Institute pre-COVID, and in fact, right as COVID started, I was going back over there to give it, and COVID shut everything down. But this is Niels Bohr's desk. So I actually got to go there to that, that famous, I was lecturing where that famous blackboard is, where there's all these, and then I, they actually had me sit down at the desk, so it was really an honor. Now, I actually, just to give everyone, I grew up in Houston, Texas, not, you know, really completely separated from the Dutch side of my family, um, and I was about, grew up about five miles from Rice University. Uh, I actually was part of the space age. I remember when Sputnik was launched, and I remember when President Kennedy gave this speech at Rice, and for all of the students here, if you haven't heard this speech, it is worth listening. This is great. In my opinion, one of the best speeches I've ever heard. Now I am, this is my field, so I may be biased, but um, it was because of this speech they founded the Rice University Department of Space Physics and Astronomy, and that is where I ended up getting my PhD. And from there, I ended up at MIT Haystack Observatory. This is where I work. It's actually closer to Nashua, New Hampshire than it is to the MIT campus, and it's a mixture. MIT Haystack Observatory is an institute, a research institute affiliated with MIT, but also Lincoln Laboratory is here. And uh, believe it or not, a lot of firsts have happened here. We're, I, I'm kind of bragging, but I think it's a great place to work. It is radio science, so that's what links us uh, 
we do the, the imaging of the black hole, but we do a lot of measurements of um, the rotation of the Earth and the coordinates, and we do, I do atmospheric science, G GPS, and they do a lot of satellite tracking and orbital debris, which as you know is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. But if I look at my family, it actually does kind of tie in. And how is this? Well, bicycle-powered radio. Well, during the war, um, my father, um, uh, they act Germans actually, there was no electricity for these people, and uh, they actually confiscated all the, the radios. But my, my dad, I mean, my family was a physics family, right? So they got the parts they needed on the black market, and they got all their bicycles, they're Dutch, right? Put them up in the attic, and they actually had, uh, they would go up there three times a day to listen to the BBC. <coughs> and that is how my father learned English faster than anyone else, because he actually was an oral learner. And they always told me, oh, he was bad at languages. But as soon as he started listening, he picked it up the fastest. They also used it to generate, you know, to read, light to read, but uh, just saying that this, this goes a long way. And if you read the book by Ruth, Lemons, uh, Ruth Lewin Sign, you'll see actually this photograph of my grandparents. And it's only, this photograph only got developed in 1970. And um, that's because when they took it, it was in March 1944, uh, so during the war, and it's actually the 25th anniversary of my grandparents' wedding anniversary. And when they showed it to me, not only do you see my, my family, that's my uncle, aunt, grandfather, grandparents, other aunt, but you also see two Jewish people there, which is why they could not develop this during the war. But for me, what was strange, there's a, a Jewish grandmother and a Jewish girl here. And I didn't hear about this until I was 18, despite the fact that you know, a big deal was made when I was growing up that, oh yes, you have to watch Anne Frank, you have to read the diary, this happened, but no mention was ever made that my family also hosted. And I, I think there was a, well, it wasn't something they felt they could really be proud of. It was something, it was their duty, if that makes sense. But just kind of remember that. So, now we go back to Lisa Minor early years with some diversions. So she's born in November 7th, 1878, and she's the third of eight children um, to uh, Philip and Hedwig Meitner. And she's born in Vienna, which is the capital of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. Her father's a lawyer, and he's one of the first Jewish men who was free to study law, and he was admitted into the practice. And her mother's a musician. Now, the family actually was definitely middle class, but they were surrounded by primarily liberal, intellectual, professional friends. They're not really driven by religion and the synagogue as much as they are as this intellectual background. And they believed in education. So at that time, girls in Vienna are only educated until age 14. Uh, but due to her family environment, all of the Meitner children received an advanced education. But Austrian universities at that time are not open to women until 1897. And at that point, Lisa and her sister studied for what's called the Matura. I, I probably mispronounced that, but it's an entrance examination to get into university. And she essentially crammed eight years of courses into two years she passed it in July 1991 at the age of 23, and she was one of four girls out of 14 that passed. Uh, one of the other girls that passed was Henrietta Boltzmann, the daughter of Boltzmann, right? So she enters the University of Vienna in October 1901. So she's the first woman that's admitted to the physics department. And her professor and PhD advisor was somebody named Franz Exner. But in her second year, she takes many courses by Ludwig Boltzmann. And he gives really stimulating lectures. He must have been a fabulous teacher. And one of the things uh, he said is that he believed that the atom was divisible, 
which actually goes against, at the time, what scientists were saying, that God had not intended it to be so, that Adam is not divisible. Um, and he also has very liberal ideas about women. I think his wife was uh, actually audited a lot of courses before they opened the university. So he accepted women students as a matter of course. And he's, as I said, he's known for being a tremendous lecturer. So she then goes on, she's the second woman to earn a doctoral degree in physics in 1906. And her thesis is a test of the formula of Maxwell's. Her PhD advisor, Exner, he comments on uh, her thing for a not entirely easy investigation <laughs> that was brought to completion not without experimental skill. So obviously, <laughs> Got a lot of support there. Now, when she actually gets out, she cannot find scientific work. It, uh, the only work she could find was as an unpaid assistant to an assistant in the university's laboratory. Uh, but she kept doing that, and she actually studied, continued to study Boltzmann's lecture notes, and along with other notes, including Lord Rayleigh, with somebody named Paul Ehrenfest. And that we're going to do a side. Thing now about Paul Ehrenfest. Uh, he's a theoretical physicist. He's about her age, and he's just <coughs> taken his PhD with Boltzmann a few years earlier than, uh, that's not mine, is it? That's somebody else. Okay. A few years earlier at the University of Vienna. Now, so this is where we're going to do our little diversion. Who was Ehrenfest? Well, he actually was the replacement for Henrik Lorentz, um, who was at the University of Leiden in Holland. And he actually, at that point, he was still act well, not active in terms of advising students, but he goes to this position, which is more, I guess, political. He was the head of what's called, a, I'm going to mispronounce this, the Taylor's, Tellier's Museum. Okay, so he, he's left, but, but Boltzmann, I mean, sorry, Ehrenfest is his replacement. The, and that in this photograph, you also see Niels Bohr. This is in 1919, the year my actually father was born. And uh, the other person there, I'm going to need my glasses, and I'm going to mispronounce this, is Heike Kammerlink Onis, who I'm sure I've mispronounced, but he was uh, a Nobel Prize winner, did superconductivity. So Holland at that time, especially Leiden, was a hotbed of intellectual physics. Uh, now, Ehrenfest turned out to be my grandfather's advisor. And I think my grandfather was the only one who was, uh, my grandfather was an experimentalist. And I think of all of his students, he was the only one, I mean, mainly Ehrenfest took over and looked over a theoretical physicist, not, not, not uh, experimentalist. But I think something between them really clicked. And he was very, very supportive of my grandfather. Now, just to put this again into perspective, my grandfather came from a family of 11 children in the Amsterdam slums. Uh, turn, they, every Sunday, they had to stay in bed, all 11 children, so his mother could wash their clothes because they only had one set of clothes. At that time, the, only, the highest they could get was a um, teacher's training degree, right? So, and he could do that and work for two years, and then he could uh, at least get step up in life to, as a teacher. And that's what he, my grandfather did. But somebody recognized him uh, as being exceptionally smart and offered to fund his university degree if he could pass this entrance exam. So this is a photograph. My grandfather's the one that's sitting down with the top hat. Doesn't look very happy at that time, but he's studying Greek and Latin at that time to get into university. So the time, by the time he got into university, he is already uh, older, significantly older than a lot of the other physics students and a lot more serious, which is, I think, why there was such a connection between Paul Ehrenfest and my grandfather. But the thing that the family really is grateful for is that at the beginning, he actually demanded, he's a, remember, he's a pretty famous physicist, uh, at, or not demanded, but asked to be taken to the slums of Amsterdam to meet my grandfather's parents so that he could congratulate them on what a great do job they've done on raising their son. So it, he was really an amazing person. 
And just again, the last photograph of my grandfather, the only other thing he did that is probably worth no noting is that he was a co-discoverer of the element hafnium. Hafnia was named, it's a Latin name for Copenhagen, and it was actually named by my grandmother, who has small children at this time, and recognized that hafnium milk products was a Latin name. They discovered it uh, right before Niels Bohr um, gave this Nobel lecture, and if you actually read it, at the very end of the lecture, he talks about this element, and it basically, that element proved that Niels Bohr's theory of the atom was correct. So, so what happens now? We're going back to Meitner. What happens to her? Well, when she's continuing working with Paul Ehrenfest, she's able to answer a problem that was unanswered by Lord Rayleigh, and she wrote the report, Some Conclusions Derived from the Fresnel Reflection Formula. But this report gave her enough confidence in her own ability that she could do independent scientific work. So it, it sort of cemented her desire to do science. Uh, but in 1906, Boltzmann took his own life. Um, he was manic depressive, and so he would, one of the reasons probably for his fantastic lectures is he was on a high, but then he would have these episodes of depression. So at age 53, he commits suicide, and she asked and received permission from her parents to go to Berlin to study with Max Planck. Now, some of the obstacles to studying in Berlin is when she gets there, Max Planck doesn't understand why she wants to study there since she already has her degree. Um, and he basically, she was not allowed to matriculate at the University of Berlin. Uh, but in, so her first years at the University of Berlin, her lab, they gave her a lab, but it's in the basement, and she's not permitted to climb the stairs to the building's higher levels. She has to stay in the basement, uh, and all the male scientists are in their lab above. Uh, but the lab had a, a carpentry room with three microscopes, which she could use to count alpha, beta, and gamma rays. And she depends on her family's allowance, although I heard this is not that unusual, but she depends on her family for a monthly allowance until 1912, when she's finally given a position grading papers for Max Planck. Uh, but it's during those uh, years, starting in 1907, that she actually starts a 30-year scientific partnership with Otto Hahn. They actually worked very well together. He's a chemist, she's a physicist. Together they actually did a lot of work, and they systematically measured beta radiation of every radioactive element and studied their spectra uh, <coughs> during this time. They explained radioactive recoil, they discovered this element, protactinium-91, uh, and as I said, she also explained the Auger effect, the radiationless transition of electrons. Um, in 1919, in all likelihood, she's the first woman in Germany to be given the title of professor at the Kaiser uh, Wilhelm Society. In the spring of 1921, she spends several weeks in Sweden <coughs> as a visiting professor at the University of Lund. This invitation came from Monty Sigmon. Remember this name, you're going to hear it again. In Sigmon's laboratory, she meets my grandfather, who's a postdoc. And he's actually there with his wife and my father, who is two at that time. And one day she meets my grandfather going to the lab on a Sunday, and she chides him. She said, no, no, Sundays are, are to be spent with your family. And according to my family, my grandfather took that seriously, and there on after never worked on Sundays again. Um, in 1922, she presented her inaugural university lecture, which I gather is still the, the they still do this in Europe. When you get your, P, you get your professorships, you still give an inaugural lecture. And uh, her, her lecture was titled The Sign Significance of Radioactivity for Cos Cosmic Processes, but the press reported it as the significance of radioactivity <laughs> for cosmetic processes. Now, Berlin was really a great place, I think, in the 1920s. It must have been, she had a lot of friends. Um, and 
I guess if, if you look at this photograph, and I don't know when it is, but you'll see there's Einstein, you'll see Lisa Meitner sitting next door to uh, Fritz Haber, who is the guy who did the chemical weapons, um, next door to Otto Hahn. The other woman I actually want to point out on the front row, on the, I forget, is this, this woman over here. She's actually Hertha Spooner, and I didn't know who she was. She's actually turned out, she was the first woman, uh, professor of physics at Duke University. Uh, she left Germany in 1933, but got a position at Duke in nuclear physics. Um, but as you can see, th it obviously was a, it, it was a wonderful crowd at that time, and they were all uh, entertaining a lot. Now, 1930s, just want to put you into position. 1932, James Chadwick discovers the neutron. 1932, Carl Anderson discovers the positron. 1933, Wolfgang Pauli proposes the existence of neutrinos to account for the apparent violation of energy conversation, conservation in certain nuclear reactions. It, it was the heyday, right? Everything's starting to come together. And you can see here a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, conferences they were having. This is the Copenhagen Spring Conference in 1932. Note, there are three women in this conference. Uh, uh, somebody was pointing that's still the same percentage. I don't know how many women are here. But there were three women, one of whom was Lisa Meitner. And uh, you can see there's many, many faces that if you recognize. The next one, somebody sent this to me. This is the Solvay 1933 conference. And again, there's three women, uh, two of whom do have a, a Nobel Prize. That's Irene Curie and Marie Curie, and I think this was the last photograph of Marie Curie before she dies. Uh, but you also see uh, Lisa Meitner. Um, and as I said, somebody sent this to me, and everybody is identified here, so you know who everyone is. But in 1933, a lot was going along politically. Uh, Adolf Hitler comes to power in 1933. At the time he comes to power, Meitner is the acting director for the Institute of Chemistry. Okay, she's the, but that's because Otto Hahn is on sabbatical in the U.S. Um, National Socialist Party members start making their presence known at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. Now she's protected because she's not a German citizen. She is an Austrian citizen. But all other Jewish scientists, including her nephew, Otto Fritsch, Fritz Haber, who's the director of uh, another Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, Leo Szilard, and many others, including, I think, Einstein, leave. And, and several of them are dismissed or forced to resign. And, and a lot of people go. Uh, did they make their exit back in Germany? Did they leave? In Germany. Oh, you mean where she is? Yeah. She's, the she's acting. It's, it's the Max Planck Institute of Chemistry. Yeah, that's where she, but she was the acting director because Otto Hahn is, is the director, and, but he's in, uh, he's in the U.S. at that time. Uh, but the reason she's in it, one, she's Austrian. Two, they kind of overlooked her. And three, she's not working for a state university. Kaiser Wilhelm is private. So she somehow she manages to stay. So everybody else is forced to leave. She's still there. But she, basically they say her response was to do nothing but bury herself in her work. However, she later acknowledged in 1946 that it was not only stupid, but also very wrong that she did not leave at once. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you is a movie. And the reason I'm going to show it to you is I, I just don't think I could quite capture everything that was going on. Uh, without this movie, so we're going to see this and you'll she get an idea. The political situation is rather strange, but I very much hope it will take a calmer, more sensible turn. We were notified last week that along with the black, white, and red flag, we must also display the swastika. A Jew by birth, Meitner became a Protestant years before in 1908. But this conversion would not protect her as Hitler's dictatorship grows more powerful and close. 
A rather large national socialist cell has formed in the Institute, and it is all quite methodical. Han returns to Berlin. He and Max Planck, president of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society, are appalled by national socialist excesses, especially the persecution of Jews. But their greatest concern is to protect their scientific institutions. The Kaiser Wilhelm Society flies the swastika, uses Heil Hitler in its correspondence, praises the Reich in its reports, accepts Nazi policy in most matters and compromises on the rest. Planck and Hahn welcomed the increased funding for military research at the Kaiser Wilhelm Society. They did not share all the ambitions of the Nazi politicians, but... So I just, I showed that because I want to get the flavor of, of what was happening. Now, uh, this is so, this is the timeline and I'm going to try and do the best job, but it, it's a lot more cloak and dagger than I think I'm going to be able to convey. But in March 1938, Austria is annexed by Germany. And so all of a sudden, remember, she has protection because she has an Austrian passport. That passport is no longer valid. Uh, and it, by June, June 16th, 1938, Peter Dubai, and you may have heard of him, the Dubai Sphere, um, he's Dutch, but he's now taken over the head of the whole, all of the Max Planck Institute. So he's working in Germany, uh, but he's now really concerned. And he writes to Niels Bohr, seeking help to obtain a position for Lisa Meitner outside of Germany. Uh, Bohr immediately starts sending requests out to scientists seeking a position for her. Uh, now, my grandfather is in Holland. He's, as I said, working in Groningen, and he finds a position for her, but it, it's funded at a postdoc salary. And that's because, you know, they were tapped out. This is 1938. They've been helping people and Jewish scientists for the last five years. They have no extra funds. All he could do is find her at this postdoc position. Adrian Fokker, who is the, from the Fokker Planck equation, He's, he's now helping, he's now in this, this political position that uh, Lorenz took at the Tellier's Museum. He helps with the immigration politics to get her entry into Holland. But at the same time, Mani Sigvan in Sweden offers her full position. Okay, so in June 27, 1938, Lisa Meitner meets with uh, Rasmussen and von Lau in Dubai, in Dubai's Berlin home. And they discuss whether she should go to Holland or Sweden. And she herself decides, I'm gonna go to Sweden, I've got a full position there, and it, it's a better position for me. And so at that time, uh, Dubai writes to, to my grandfather and to Adrian Fokker, and they said, don't, don't keep working for her to come to Holland, she's gonna go to Sweden. All right, so that's at the end of June. Now, what happens on July 4th, uh, Lisa Meitner spends the evening with Han and Hertz in Dubai's home, so they're back at Peter Dubai's house. But at that point, Peter Dubai and Lisa Meitner agree that she has to leave immediately. And that's because of the imminent strict enforcement of the policy prohibiting the departure of scientists from Germany. And I think they also knew that her case had gone up to, the, to Himmler himself. And they, they were pretty certain that she was not going to be able to work and she was not going to be able to leave Germany. So they knew they had to get her out. So Peter Dubai, on July 6, sends, I guess it was a letter, but it might have been a telegram, a letter, an SOS, and he, he writes to my grandfather in Holland and it's done, again, it's cloak and dagger. He says, I have an assistant I want you, that I want you to come look over uh, as soon as possible uh, as if it was an SOS. So it was all, it wasn't directly come, come in, get Lisa Meitner out, but I need you to come as soon as you can. Well, unfortunately, they had already been told to drop all their arrangements to get Lisa Meitner into Holland. And remember, 
She not only has to get out of Germany, she has to get into Holland. That means they have to accept her. So at that point, uh, my grandfather gets back in contact with uh, Adrian Fokker, and uh, a, they have to actually call a special meeting of the National Academy of Sciences, the Dutch one, to get permission for her to get into Holland, all right? So they, they do that. Do you have, yeah? She's single. She's single. And she never married. Yeah, it's just her. Um, she never married. But so, um, right, so they finally get approval, I think, on the Monday that they, they can get her. But this whole time, the people in Germany don't know what's going on. But they get approval, and they, my grandfather then, and Hanning is in the north of Holland, so it's probably not as active a border crossing as the southern part of Holland. But my grandfather and his neighbor, who was high up in the Honinga politician, so somebody like the mayor or somebody high up, go to the Dutch border guards. And they say, look, here's her. This woman is going to pass on Wednesday with a, a, an invalid passport. It's Austrian. But we're going to let her in. Here's all the paperwork. And they figured that the Dutch border guards were good friends with the German border guards. and and they would let the Germans know that there was, nothing was going to happen if the, they let her through, like there was not going to be any issue. But again, anything could have happened at that border crossing. So uh, I guess on the 11th, my grandfather gets on a train, goes to Berlin late in the evening, and he stays with Peter the Bai. My understanding is he did not see Lisa Meitner until the morning of the 13th. And <laughs> at that time, they meet as if accidentally at the train station. Uh, Lisa Meitner actually is told to pack a suitcase with just a few clothes, not very much. And uh, she gets to the, the train station. And at that point, Otto Hahn gives her a diamond ring from his mother, only so she would have something if she needed to bribe the border guards uh, as they were crossing. Now, what I've heard the story is right before they get to the border, my grandfather takes that ring and puts it in his pocket so that if they see it, they won't automatically take it. But essentially, there was no problem at the border crossing. The, you know, they had already talked to their Dutch guards, and my grandmother thought the reason was probably she's a very short, petite woman. They probably thought she was somebody's wife. You know, they had no idea she was an international nuclear physicist. Uh, and at the end of the day, my grandfather telegraphs Otto Hahn that the baby has arrived safely. And uh, this, and this is in Dutch, I don't know if you can see it, but it says 13th July, 38, and I can't read German, but I think the translation is happily over the border brought. And then you can see Lisa Meitner. Uh, is that, did I translate it correctly? Yes. Yeah, okay. Now, what I found very interesting is right above that signature is the name of Sam, uh, Sam Houtsmet. If you know who he is, he, Houtsmet and Uhlenbeck were the discoverers of the electron spin. They were also students of uh, Ehrenfest, and he was a friend of my grandfather's. The reason I was surprised was, one, he's Jewish. Two, what is he doing back in Holland? He's at the University of Michigan. And so I actually did a little bit more digging about this, and you're going to hear a bit more about Sam Haldsmith later in the story. But um, when she gets, I don't know how long she was staying with my grandfather. It may have been only a week. My uncle remembers that she was very petite and very agitated and was walking back and forth saying, the Pope, the Pope. My uncle's, who was, my uncle was 13 at the time, his interpretation was, uh, she was saying that because the only person who could reverse this situation was the Roman Catholic Pope. Um, and that's probably true. If the Pope had come out against what was happening, this might have been averted. But later on, somebody said, well, everybody called, in that circle, Niels Bohr was called the Pope. And it was probably because, it, so it's, she's probably referring to Niels Bohr because it's because of his intervention that she got out. Uh, but she makes it to Holland, and I just want to point this out. She's 59 years old. She has 
without her belongings, just one small suitcase and 10 marks, and that is it. She's had to just walk out. And remember, she gets to Germany and she's worked up to where she's head of a, la a whole physics laboratory. I mean, she's had to give up everything to go there. And um, she stays in Holland and then she goes to Sweden to take a position working at this new institute run by Monty Sigbon. And I, I'll let you know, at least from my family connections, I don't think she was very happy there. That's all I'll say. She wasn't very happy there. But Sweden is the only place in Europe that it was really safe for her to go because Sweden was never occupied by Germany. It would not have been safe for her to go to uh, Germany. Now, <laughs> we're back to Sam Houdsmith. I have a personal affinity for him. One, he was a friend of my grandfather's. And you can see here, that's Hans Kramer's. Uh, Sam Houdsmith's the one with the camera. And that's George Uhlenbeck. And above, that's actually I guess the students of Ehrenfest would meet at his house in the garden and they would drink beer every Friday afternoon. What a nice thing to do with your advisor. But that, that's what's going on. And I, I'm still trying to figure out, well, what was he doing in Holland at that time, right? But, uh, and why was he visiting uh, my grandfather? So I actually went to the Institute of Physics, the American Institute of Physics, and all of his correspondence is on the web, and one of them is a letter from my grandfather written actually on the 11th of July, which is the day that he went into Germany to get her out. And he, he's talking here, if you'll see, uh, it's all in Dutch, and I did have it translated by my uncle once, but basically he's saying the Dubai letter, there's a Dubai letter, SOS letter, uh, about coming to look for an assistant, it's Lisa Meitner, I'm going to uh, Berlin, and I'll be coming back with or without Lisa Meitner on Wednesday. And, and he's ask, ask, asking him to come visit, look at some of their equipment, their laboratory, and oh, by the way, maybe you know of some potential employment for Lisa Meitner in the US. I mean, that's, that's what this letter is about. Um, I have another photograph here. This is actually at Leiden. And You'll recognize a lot of people, but right at the front, you'll see uh, uh, Han, uh, Adrian Fokker and Hans Kramers. And then there's uh, Sam Houdsmith at the end. And over here is Uhlenbeck. And actually buried in the back is Oppenheimer, if you can see him. And you can actually see the wife of Aaron Fest. She's a mathematician. I'll say a few words. There's Aaron Fest. Uh, and uh, I did realize later on that, and I never made this connection, my brother is named Hans Adrian, and he was named after Hans Kramers and Adrian Fokker. So I, I thought, oh, I didn't kind of ever fully appreciate that. And then there's just one more photograph of my grandfather was Max von Lau and Otto Hahn. Again, this was in Germany, and I don't know. So now we have the next movie, and this talks about the discovery of fission. And again, I'm not a nuclear physicist. This is, does a better job. It is a little on the hokey side, but uh, <laughs> just it, forgive me. And you can hear it? Everybody can hear it? For Hahn and Strassman, however, Meitner remains a member of the Berlin team. Throughout the fall of 1938, Otto frequently writes to Lisa about their progress, often asking for advice and interpretation on their experiments with uranium. One of the things they're looking at is a report by Irene Curie from Paris of a new substance that derives from the irradiation of uranium with neutrons. The curio substance is radioactive and present in amounts so small that it can only be detected by a guided hunter. The new radioactivity behaves like barium, but Hahn and Strassmann do not think it is barium, since they expect only small changes in nuclear reactions. So they conclude that the new substance must be radium, which is chemically similar to barium, in the same group in the periodic table. November 9, 1938, the night of broken glass, the Kristallnacht, an organized government program against the Jews. Four days later, Hahn travels to Copenhagen 
where Mesa is visiting the Bohr Institute. It has been four months to the day since they last saw each other, and he is eager to discuss his latest findings with her. Meitner came to meet him at his train. They went to his hotel, had breakfast, and talked for hours. And we also know from Han's diary that Han met Niels Bohr, he met Otto Robert Frisch, and other physicists in the Copenhagen Institute, and they, they all objected to Han's new radium findings. Han soon returned to Berlin, but in Europe, the political situation is getting worse. Han realizes that he cannot tell anyone that he has met with Meitner, not even Strassmann, but he does tell him that Mise has urgently requested that they re-examine the radium findings, and so they begin a new experiment. To prove they really do have radium, they will separate it from all other elements. Their method is fractional crystallization, or fractionation. They fully expect that they'll be able to separate the radium from the barium carrier. But the experiments do not go as planned. 19 December, 1938. Dear Lisa, last week I fractionated thorium X. It went exactly as it should. Then on Saturday, Strassmann and I fractionated our radium isotope with mesothorium one as indicator. The mesothorium became enriched. Our radium did not. It could still be an extremely strange coincidence, but we are coming steadily closer to the frightful conclusion. Our radium isotopes do not act like radium, but like barium. And what they find, and this is the big discovery, they find they can't separate those radioactive isotopes from the barium carrier. There is something about the radium isotope that is so remarkable that for now, we are telling only you. They can be separated from all elements except barium. And if you can't separate it, there's only one conclusion. And they reach this conclusion shortly before Christmas, 1938. Their conclusion is that those isotopes are not radium at all, but are actually barium. Uranium has produced barium, radioactive barium. This is what Hahn and Strassmann have found. But how can a uranium nucleus change into barium, which is so much smaller? Hahn needs a nuclear physicist to explain this mystery. He turns to Mise Meitner. Perhaps you can come up with some fantastic explanation. Before the Institute closes for Christmas, we do want to write something for publication. So please think about whether there is any possibility. 21 December, 1938. Dear Otto. Your radium results are very startling. A reaction with slow neutrons that supposedly leads to barium. At the moment, the assumption of such a thoroughgoing breakup of the uranium nucleus seems difficult to me. But in nuclear physics, we have experienced so many surprises that one cannot unconditionally say it is impossible. Han was mystified as to how that could take place, how there could be barium in the among the reaction products. Otto Hahn made a discovery in late 1938, but he didn't know the meaning of his discovery. She is the physicist. It's up to her to explain the data from chemistry that doesn't make any sense. Intuitively, Meitner was ready for the massive breakup of the uranium nucleus, even though the idea had no place yet in nuclear theory. If there is anything you could propose that you could publish, then it would still, in a way, be work by the three of us. It's Christmas. Mise is spending the holidays with friends. She invites her nephew, Otto Robert Frisch, a physicist, to join them. After their arrival, Frisch finds his aunt studying Hahn's letter and obviously worried about it. Hahn and Strassmann had found that those substances were not radium, but barium. We took a walk up and down in the snow, I on skis and she on foot. And gradually, the idea took shape. This was no chipping or cracking of the nucleus, but rather a process to be explained by Bohr's idea that the nucleus is like a liquid drop. Such a drop might elongate and split in two. At this point, we both sat down on a tree trunk and started to calculate on scraps of paper. And we found that the uranium nucleus might indeed be a very wobbly, unstable drop ready to divide itself at the slightest provocation, such as the impact of a neutron. But there was another problem. 
When the smaller two drops separated, they would be driven apart and would require a very large energy, about 200 million electron volts in all. Very rapidly, they calculate the debris left over by the fissioning, the break of the uranium. And when they add it up, they find something missing. She worked out that the two nuclei formed by the splitting of the uranium nucleus would be lighter than the original uranium nucleus. There's missing mass. And then they calculate how much energy is lost in the nucleus of the atom. 200 million electron volts. That's hundreds of millions of times greater than the energy lost in a chemical reaction. And they said, what is the relationship between energy and mass? And then it dawned on them on Christmas Eve, 1938, E equals MC squared. Whenever mass disappears, energy is created according to Einstein's formula. Here was the source for that energy. It all fit. Now Einstein predicted it, but he didn't know how to unleash it. Here was Lisa Meitner and Otto Fritz saying, this is how we do it. In January 1939, Hahn and Strassmann published their barium finding in Naturwissenschaften. Meitner's name is not included. In February 1939, Meitner and Frisch published their theoretical explanation in Nature. They understand the process and name it, nuclear fission. The discovery is a complete surprise and sensational news to scientists everywhere. <clears throat> so, again, I will review those dates. Um, remember, they just did this experiment. January 6, 1939, Hahn and Strassmann report in a German chemist, I'm not going to even pronounce this, but German magazine, uh, their chemical findings for fission. And then a month later, Meitner and Frisch publish in nature, the physical interpretation. And this was like huge. I think it went across, I mean, everybody picked up on this right away. Um, but Hahn, remember, is in Germany. He cannot acknowledge, at that point, he can't acknowledge that he has done any work or any had any contact with Lisa uh, since she's left Germany. So he, he cannot mention her in his paper. Somebody was pointing out she did mention him in her paper, but he can't acknowledge any, anything with her. <clears throat> then what happens, um, he's awarded the Nobel Prize in chemistry for the discovery of nuclear fission. Uh, now, I gather when they were looking at it, um, her name was up there, and according to the records, they didn't fully understand what her role was in this. Um, and you may say, well, her work was physics, which it was, but just remember, Einstein got his Nobel Prize in chemistry. So, if, yeah, if you look at it, his, his first, is, it's in chemistry. Um, but nevertheless, she's also, after that, she's nominated to receive the Nobel Prize in physics 12 times. Many of those times are by Niels Bohr. The head of the Physics Nobel Prize Committee is Monty Sigban. Remember, he's her boss. And as at least for my family, there was some tension between them, although I've heard from the Nobel, somebody in the Nobel Prize Committee, actually, when I gave this talk, basically said, oh no, he was very supportive of her. All I can say is that's not what my family said. I, I leave it at that. But what did happen is even after the war, Otto Hahn never acknowledged Lisa Meitner's role. The fact that he, he got the award, maybe that's okay, but he should have acknowledged her role in this discovery after, and he didn't. Um, now, she actually... Well, it's... Yeah, they are separate. Right. right. So Han published two of them on the chemist she had. So, but I think, and we're arguing that she was involved in in sort of getting him to redo those chemistry. Yeah, I mean, that, that 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 I think that's the role, not 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 the, but her role in actually getting him to redo and relook at that. Yeah, so that's. that's uh, Yeah. 
yeah, this is true. This is true, yeah. So, all right, then, uh, and supposedly she wrote this letter to Otto Hahn but never mailed it, but it was kept in her, she kept it in her correspondence, so maybe she meant for somebody to find it. Uh, and she said, you all worked for Nazi Germany and you tried to offer only a passive resistance. Certainly to buy off your conscience, you helped here and there a persecuted person, but millions of innocent human beings were allowed to be murdered without any kind of protest being uttered. It is said, first you betrayed your friends, then your children, and that you let them stake their lives on a criminal war, and finally that you betrayed Germany itself. Because when the war was already quite hopeless, you did not once arm yourself against the senseless destruction of Germany. Now, this, she didn't mail this to him, and I should say they did remain friends until the end of their life. But I think there was at least this letter, at least incorporates some of the anger she may have felt towards him. Um, and I want to point out she did win a number of other awards. Um, actually, in 1924, she won, and I'm going to mispronounce this, Leibniz Medal, Ber Berlin Academy of Science. Uh, when all this happened with the Nobel Prize, Eleanor Roosevelt actually made, got her Woman of the Year by the Women's National Press Club in Washington, D.C., and actually there's several photographs of her giving lectures at, uh, I think it's American University in Bryn Mawr, but she came and did a tour of the women's colleges uh, at that time. She won, and this is a very prestigious medal, the Max Planck Medal uh, from the German Physics Society in 1949, and right before she died, uh, she won with Otto Hahn and Strassmann the Enrico Fermi Prize uh, by the Atomic Energy Commission. And finally, I would say the Element 109, Mike Miriam, in 1992, is named after her. So now I have a few additional comments that are going to kind of change this a little bit, but when I was at my aunt's house, I actually got to <laughs> see this photograph, and I'm like, oh my God, this is Lorenz. And, um, and my grandfather actually worked for him before he got his university position. That was what happened in Holland, and I'm like, oh my God. Um, and I have a, one of my grandfather's textbooks that's written in English. It's the one they gave me, and it's written in English because it was at the Univers University of Columbia, Columbia, his lecture notes from 1906. It talks about the ether. I mean, it's just, oh my God. Um, then here, I guess this is my grandfather's physics um, equipment back in, I guess, the 1930s, and here, this is her physics, and this is the one that I understand they did not, they did not have it correctly acknowledged, but now it is. It has, they have actually gone and recognized this is hers, but it wasn't. It's at the Max Planck Institute and how they actually made their measurements. I have this photograph only, this is Paul Ehrenfest, Neil, Niels Bohr and his son, uh, but I want to say here is actually a nice family photograph where you see all the children of the physicists. That's Paul Ehrenfest, my father, Hans Koster, Susie Cromer, Cromers, that's one of the Cromers children, uh, my aunt, another Cromers child, and then there's this Helbert Domstein, we don't know who he was, and another Koster, but they're all like in a row, sort of cute. Um, this actually was one of my aunt's uh, things, but when she was born, uh, the family got a postcard from Paul Ehrenfest, and the top is in Dutch, but it, it's, it's to congratulate my grandparents for having their third child. But after Paul Ehrenfest signs it, there's a signature from Albert Einstein uh, congratulating my grandfather on the birth of their child. Now, if you ever go to Leiden, the University of Leiden, this is Paul Ehrenfest's house. I've showed you where he used to actually have the, his students over every for their beers. You get your, your faculty advisors to do that. Uh, he had a big house, and I actually, my cousin's been in it. Inside that house, there's a wall where everybody, everybody signs it. Uh, you know, and my grandfather's signature is there somewhere, but you know, Einstein, did, all the physicists who visited signed this wall. It's still there. The, some, f f supposedly when my cousin saw it, was owned by some kind of recluse, and it had gotten in disrepair. But the University of Leiden has bought this. It's going to become a museum. They're in restoration. So 
I am hoping someday to be able to go there and sign it. Um, it was in this house where Niels Bohr and Einstein had their big debates about quantum chem dice, throwing, God throwing dice. Um, so I would really like to go in there. And on the outside, and this I was able to take a, a photograph, not only does it say here is the, this is where Professor Ehrenfest lived and worked, but it also recognizes his wife. And it says, in her time, um, she made this house open for um, people and ideas. And I just think it's, so, it's just so nice. So I highly recommend it. The other thing that's in my uh, grandfather, this is actually, I think, in Niels um, Bohr's office, but it's the other end from where his desk is. Uh, that's my grandfather in the sort of tweed coat, coat but uh, you'll see uh, Niels Bohr's at the center. Um, there's Hans Kramers, but there's actually uh, Polly, and I didn't realize that um, he was such a funny guy, but he had this thing, it says, that's not right, it's not even wrong. But I'm gonna read this also. To a certain degree, Polly definitely had what we now would call psychic powers. His colleagues, colleagues called it the Polly effect, meaning that when Polly entered a laboratory regularly, some experimental equipment would break down in an inexplicable manner. Despite their friendship, the experimental physicist Otto Stern even banned Polly from entering his <laughs> laboratory. Um, and I, I guess my uncle kept telling me, he just starts laughing. I guess he, he came to visit my, he must have been a, just a really funny person. And I have this picture, uh, that's Polly and Niels Bohr, obviously in 1951, uh, looking at the physics of this top. They call it the tippy top. So. Um, now, another, just as an other side note, remember the Jewish girl that was in that photograph that I said my family actually helped? Well, she actually became a famous poet in uh, Holland. And in fact, when my aunt passed away, she actually read uh, some, a poem she wrote for my aunt, only I didn't recognize it was her. I had just flown over. I mean, I had flown over overnight, you know, from Boston. I just made it, I mean, I'd just been there in Holland for a couple of hours, I was dead tired. It's all in Dutch, so I'm not, I couldn't pick it up right away, and I didn't realize who it was until after she left. But um, she actually did, both of them lived, but she lived and became probably one of the better known poets in Holland. Now, Holland's a small country, and we're talking Dutch, but nevertheless, I, she was pretty, I was pretty impressed when I heard her speak. I just, I wish I had known who, who she was. And, and then this I want to read, it's not the end, but I want to read this because I, I did this detective work about Sam Goudsmit, and I was still trying to figure out, well, why, why is he in Holland in 1938? And this is a letter he wrote back to Professor Randall, who was head of the, nuclear, of the physics department at the University of Michigan. And I think he's basically essentially asking for a, ra a raise, but I want you to listen to this. Uh, he said, to be asked to be a successor to our last Nobel laureate, Seaman, is considered to be a great honor. So he was being considered for a professorship in Holland. Such a position brings with it a great deal of prestige and recognition. The laboratory is very beautiful and well-equipped for optics. Nice work has also been done on isotopes a, um, a Thompson method, and there are many possibilities for high-tension nuclear work, probably neutrons only. It has its own shop with me uh, mechanics and glass blower, and it's very nicely built. Next door is the laboratory of Professor Clay, who is well known for his cosmic ray measurements. The salary is about 4,600. Um, considering the cost of living, this is equivalent with almost 6,500 at Ann Arbor. A professor here is said to be the second highest paid official. Um, of course, the way of living is different over here. It may be difficult to own a car and a refrigerator, but one can afford a large, beautiful home, servants, and a nice vacation trips to France, Switzerland, Italy, etc. On the other side is the Jewish problem. It is disgusting to notice that good students cannot find employment in America only because they happen to be Jewish. 
Do you know the official list of approved rooms for students at Michigan continues this year with the entry Gentiles only with many addresses? Do you know that instructor R of the history department started his freshman class last September with the remark that there are too many Jews and that he would get rid of them by mid semester? In Holland, there is no discrimination against Jews in spite of a small, noisy, German-paid Nazi group. There is, of course, some danger of an invasion by the Germaniacs, and the next war between Germania and England will probably be fought on Dutch soil and in Dutch air. Now, I don't know if he got his raise. I can say that he did go back to Michigan. Actually, my grandfather told him not to come to Holland. So I think my grandfather knew something bad was happening. Holland managed to be neutral during World War I. It didn't last. It lasted three days in World War II. Um, the sad thing is I did meet his daughter, and I realized he got visas for his parents to come over to the US like two days before Germany marched into Holland. He was not able to get him out. They were picked up by the Gestapo, and my, my grandfather wrote to um, Heisenberg, and Heisenberg never answered. So, so pretty much their entire uh, Dutch side, Sam Hausmann's family was wiped out, the Dutch side. <coughs> and, and it was, yeah, pretty upsetting. Now, he actually, I think, had somewhat survivor's guilt. He worked for an MIT radiation lab, and then after the war, he was involved with going around to figure out what Heisenberg and everybody did with the bomb. So he, he was pretty active. I forget the name of that project. So uh, I'm still not quite, it's almost uh, two more slides. Um, basically, Albert Einstein called Lisa Meitner the most significant woman scientist of the 20th century. I would agree that she's probably one of the most, sci the most significant scientists of the 20th century. But she's certainly somebody, we should not forget her name. Um, and I want everyone here to be aware that in 2019, we did publish in Physics Today a renaming proposal for the Auger effect, the Auger-Meitner effect. You can go look it up. And um, somewhat being a, a, it's beginning to be accepted. The Ursi General Assembly adopted this pr proposal um, and actual Demetrius, who was the first author, he's the main person who's done this work. Uh, I am writing to call your attention to a resolution that was passed at our General Assembly in 2021. It supports a proposal that the OJ effect be renamed to the OJ Meitner effect. It empowers our officers to solicit the support of international physics societies so that it would be accepted by researchers, teachers, authors, and editors that comprise the physics communities. We are therefore writing to you as well as to your sister societies to ask you consider this proposal. Uh, there is strong, as there is, if there is strong support for this renaming within your organization and your sister societies, we ask you to join us in making this proposal uh, known as widely as possible. We are pleased to learn, for example, that a reference to the Auger-Meitner electrons electrons has already been incorporated into the 12th edition of Fundamentals of Physics by Holiday, Resnick, and Walker, and we hope that you act with deliberate speed to ensure standardization of this terminology in future presentations. So if you guys know of anybody or need anything, I can, I can give you some support for this. And uh, It is beginning to be accepted. We notice there's like six publications now that are using it. All right, and that's the end of the talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I can answer anything. Yeah. We do have time for a few questions. If anyone has questions, Marcus. 39? Sure, I can. This one? I think that's in Germany. Yeah, that's, that's the same as you showed earlier. Yeah. Chemistry. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah no. Earlier, right, I, I just split it. Yeah. There are two, but yeah. But I, what I can't tell you is the year, only that my grandfather was standing. So it, I would say mid-1935, but I don't know when. Oh, do you mean how, how women's lib was she? I think she was focused more on her work. I, I honestly think that was her primary, I don't think she, I don't think she said too much about it. I, she was, yeah, her life was her work. So they, I think you were first. I have no idea. That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I can I can look that up. I, I will ask my Dutch relatives. I will say if anybody goes to Leiden, and you go to um, the church there that where the pilgrims left from, my one of my cousins is the head of that. She's a minister, the the main minister at that church. So if you go to Leiden, go to that church. <laughs> Eric, was Mike there at all? No. No, I don't think so, no. That's true. They all left, and they, they actually melted down. Um, the guy that co-discovered Von Hevesy, he melted all their Nobel Prize. Um, yeah, right, yeah. Oh, well, uh, so I actually... Oh, there, it, and, uh, so, okay, well, I'm glad you told me that. I went to his grave. Did you know it's here? I've gone to his grave. Just, and, I took flowers to it, and, too. And, and, and of course, that uh, when Moore came to the United States, he announced that the petition at George Gamow's conference was to elevate Washington, D.C., 1939. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I did know, but I, well, that's wonderful. I hadn't, all I can say is I've yeah, gone to his. Very back, and, and that's the there it is. from which he and his wife uh, uh, defected from uh, Russia, that uh, Soviet Union. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for, as I said, somebody took me there to his grave and we took flowers to it. I don't think he ever knew my grandfather, but that's a wonderful connection. Yeah, I did, oh, that's wonderful. If I might add one comment. Uh, Mike was a major player in experiments on beta decay, and in the spectrum in the period 1910 through 1945. He was already a major figure in physics well before nuclear physics. If there are no further comments or questions. Oh, wait, there's one more. after the war, only after the war. She never went, no, no, it's not safe for her to go back into Germany. Uh, but after the war, she did, yes. Um, although all of the letters that she wrote to my grandfather, this was something that, after the war, they only wrote in English to each other, whereas before the war, they wrote in German. Now, of course, my grandfather's Dutch, <laughs> but I'm just saying that she did in some sense, separate herself away from Germany after the war. Um, question there. <laughs> so you said she was 59 years old in 1938. So after the war, she's in her late 60s. Yeah. But did she immigrate to the United States? No. Then no. Oh, what, is what, what is that noise? Is that me? No, she, she ended up at, with her Otto Frisch in Cambridge. And supposedly, we were talking about this. There was, I'm, I think it's me. Um, supposedly, there was this movie that Hollywood, she did like the United States. I'm sorry, she had wanted nothing to do with the, the bomb. She didn't want anything to do with that. 
And I also, and this happened, I think, to my grandfather. Af right after they got, he read about the bomb, he was depressed. But my, um, according to my father, the reason he was depressed was not, not what you would think about the bomb, but he was depressed that he didn't recognize any of the nuclear physicists, any of the names. Prior to the war, you know, they knew everybody, and then, then it moved to the U.S. And, and there was so much development during World War II, and I think the mathematics and the physics got a lot harder. Now, with her, they were going to make a movie, and the, it was all Hollywoodized, and somebody said they were going to have her sneaking the bomb out from her <laughs> skirt or something. And, and she basically, she made this statement somewhere that she would rather walk naked down Broadway than to have a movie made of her life by Hollywood. So she, but nevertheless, Eleanor Ra Roosevelt did, as I said, came and she did a, 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 long t a lot of tours with the women's colleges. So she did do and met with a lot of, you, you'll see photographs of her in the US with the women physicists. And I know I am definitely starting to, what? There's something outside. Oh, okay. So, but, but so she ended up in, and died in, uh, and she probably essentially retired after the war and went to um, Cambridge, where Otto Frisch was. I do? Yes, you do. Okay. <laughs> I just feel Thanks like so it's... Much, yeah. uh, no, no, it really should be in physics today. Okay. Because well. that's where everybody will see it. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, I am going to part-time, so maybe... <laughs> well, look, as I told you, being retired doesn't mean... You oh, no, I'm not going to stop working, but I may have maybe less time for... Now I'm in the manager, and yeah. as you know how that goes. <laughs>